Welcome back to another episode of Podcast on the Brink. Pleased to be joined this week by a name that would be familiar uh, to IU fans. Uh, he spent three years uh, in Bloomington as a walk-on, spent two years as a graduate manager, and now he's moved on to the next phase in his life, and we'll, we'll talk to him a little bit about that later in the show. Uh, but Johnny Jager, welcome to Podcast on the Brink. Good to be talking to you today. I'm so happy you reached out. I'm glad to be on the podcast. Hopefully we can have a little fun while we talk some some hoops, Hoosiers and and beyond. So I want to go back to just kind of your your formative years in Bloomington, growing up in Bloomington, playing for Bloomington South. I'm I'm sure you grew up an IU fan. What what are some of your earliest memories just as a kid of playing basketball and growing up following uh, Indiana basketball? Who were some of the players that you really enjoyed watching and uh, and grew grew up looking up to. Yeah, so I mean, growing up in Bloomington, it's every little boy's dream to you know put on the cream and crimson and become a Hoosier. And from the very start, I my love and passion was basketball. You know, I was that's my one true love I've always had, and you know, still will always have. But you know, when I was young, it was Midnight Madness before it was Hoosier Hysteria. You know, and and my is when you bring in those canned goods in to get in the arena and. You know, I was, I remember being really little and struggling to make it to midnight in order to go. But, you know, my dad would bring me and they, I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. And so, you know, like every other kid, I wanted to be like them. I'd practice in the driveway, counting down three, two, one, trying to make that that final shot. But uh, so very, very love for basketball and the Hoosiers from the very start. I had a unique opportunity when I was in fifth grade. Um, I actually got to be a ball boy for the IU basketball games. And that was when uh, it was Kelvin Sampson's last year when they had Eric Gordon and they were a really good team. And so when I was able to be a ball boy, got that opportunity, that was like so cool, the coolest thing ever. And I, one, one distinct memory I remember is, you know, when they did used to do that at halftime, the ball boys would shoot, you know, while, while the team was back in the locker room game planning. So I was out on the court and I was shooting threes and I started making a few shots. And so then the, uh, the crowd started getting into it a little bit. I made a few more. I made a few more. And by the end of it, the crowd was kind of going crazy. So as a fifth grader shooting on assembly hall, making threes in front of tons of fans, that was, you know, that's a memory I'll have forever. But see, I rolled the tape forward and uh, my days at Bloomington South were, you know, unforgettable as well. I got to play for hall of fame legend, J.R. Holmes, you know, and he was an excellent coach. Someone I still talk to today coached all, me and my brothers, you know, so we had a Jager on South Panthers team for, I think, 10 years straight. And so, yeah, we have great love for obviously South and Coach Holmes. And, you know, it was just a great place to grow up and cultivate a love of, of basketball. So coming out of Bloomington South, uh, you went to, to Wabash originally, had a, a really good freshman season there, but you made the decision after that, I think that first year that you were going to come to IU and walk on. How, how do you, how, how does that happen? Uh, you know, obviously it's something you, you dream of uh, growing up, being able to put on the IU uniform. Is it just you reaching out to the IU staff and saying, hey, I'm, I'm looking to, to change the situation? How did that all kind of materialize you uh, transferring from, uh, from Wabash over to IU? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so Wabash was, it was an amazing experience too. And there's nothing that Wabash did or didn't do that made me want to become a Hoosier. You know, I loved my time at Wabash. I still talk to friends that I made there every single day, just had my wedding and two of my buddies from Wabash were in it, you know, and then the basketball part was a great too. I had a, a good season and, 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 you know, it was, it was great times, but um, one of the big indicators of me coming to IU was just uh, how I really wanted to become a college basketball coach. That became my career goal. And, um, uh, my family, we had a relationship with coach Tom Crean at the time. And so I, I, you know, I hit him up and was just like, Hey coach, I would just love to, you know, pick your brain a little bit, talk about the profession. How did you get into it? How do you like it? Pros, cons, you know, just to talk. And, um, you know, I met him at cook hall and we ended up con- conversing for hours. You know, it was, he was an open book. He was so helpful and, you know, influential and in making me, you know, even more excited to become a college basketball coach. And it was, it was kind of just an aligning of the stars. You know, um, one of the walk-ons at, on the team currently had just transferred to go play somewhere else. So there was an open roster spot. And as, you know, our con- 
conversations further, you know, he was like, you know what, John, if you really are thinking about doing the college basketball route, we have an open roster spot. Why don't you come see it firsthand at the Big Ten at the highest level at IU? You know, I've seen you play for years. I know you'd be a good walk on in that regard. You positive guy, you know, and you get to see what you future, what you want to do. And, you know, that's, that's where it happened. And and I was obviously like just caught off guard for one, but then also like, wow, like this could be a reality. And, and that's why I ended up making the jump is just because, you know, that's a dream of every college or every Bloomington kid and every kid in Indiana. And so having that opportunity, it was one that I just couldn't pass up. And, and even all my people at Wabash, they completely understood. And, and, you know, I would do it over again. If I had to, I do the same way. And I've learned so much throughout that, those years at IU and had some of the best times of my life and will have memories forever from it. So your first year, I believe was Tom Crean's actually his last season in Bloomington as the coach. So you get there right after they win the big 10 championship, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. what w- that season, I I remember it pretty clearly because of how promising it started out and how mm-hmm. how poorly it ended. Do you, a lot of people look back at that and say, um, you know, if OG doesn't get hurt, maybe it turns out differently. Maybe you know things turn out differently in general for IU basketball and Tom Green. Do you think it came down to to, to that? Was that really a turning point in the season, or do you think there were? other things maybe that that were uh contributing factors to maybe that season not turning out uh, the way everyone had hoped based on how it started because i remember the, mm-hmm. I think they beat kansas to start this start oh, yeah. the year and and things were, were going pretty well yeah we I, I mean that was the tale of two seasons really i mean we we beat kansas in that aircraft carrier game and then we came home in the acc big 10 challenge and we beat north carolina so we we were like right number three in the country number one power ranking, and then ended up not making the tournament. And uh, you mentioned OG's injury. I think that that did play a big part in it. I don't think it was all of it. You know, there's a lot of times there's multiple reasons why things take a turn for the better or for the worse. Usually not one thing can, can make that happen. But OG was an incredible player. You know, he was our best defender. He was a guy that every team had to uh, key on on the offensive end and game plan for. So, it, you know, it was a huge hole that we thought we were going to have. And then there's just, you know, when things start going south, it's hard to turn it around again. You know, people don't realize how difficult it is to win and to win consistently every single time, day in and day out, game by game. It's, it's so difficult, especially for 20 to 22 year old guys who are in college, who have so many things going on, who have career aspirations and everything. I mean, it's, it's so hard and everybody's so good. You know, so you have to be on your game 100% of the time. And, you know, I think it just, you know, it, we we maybe have lacked a little bit of leadership here and there. But, it, I mean, it's just hard to, once you get down that path, it's 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 difficult to to turn the turn the corner in the other way. And especially when you lose one of your best players, you know, you start getting down and you start seeing the media and what they're saying about you and the team and, and possibly the coach. And, and that, for 20, 20 year old kids, never helps. So... It hurt not having OG, but it, there was a couple dominoes in there that also may have fell. The one thing that's it's always been interesting to me, like IU basketball, as we both know, you're under a microscope at all times, and so really the you know the the momentum can shift so quickly, and that season's a perfect example of going to Hawaii and having that great win beating North Carolina to, Mm -hmm. you know, an injury to OG and then, you know, down the stretch, can't win a game. Don't even, uh, you know, make the tournament. And I think that was the year where, where Indiana played. I think it was the NIT game down at Georgia tech. Cause I remember driving down Mm -hmm. there thinking, man, I'm I'm really driving down here to Georgia to cover an NIT game. And and it, it seemed like the players were probably equally as excited maybe to play that game just based on, you know, the promise of the season you know, they, they came out flat. It wasn't a great performance, but I, I'm curious just from a player's perspective, when you start losing, how much of that negativity from the outside does creep in and how difficult is it kind of when you get into that rut to kind of turn things back in a positive direction? It is so difficult. It's, it, it, I mean, IE fans are incredible, you know, especially when things are going well, you know, like you said, the momentum can go up 
or down. And when it starts going down, it's hard. And, and, you know, with young kids who are the gener today's gen generation, it's all social media, everything, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. That's what we look at. That's what we live. That's, you know, that's our lives. And to, for people to say that, you know, they need to delete it or not look, it doesn't, they're not trying to look it's right there in front of them and it's impossible to avoid. And with, you know, the way that it is today, like that takes, that takes a huge toll on a young person's mindset and what they think about themselves, what they think about life. You know, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to avoid it for one. And then two, to not think it's real or, you know, cause we're all human. You know, we all hear what people say. We take it to heart. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me is the most false thing ever. And so it it is so difficult. And, you know, that's why it, it it's, you know, people need to be sensitive about what they say, because, you know, think of how you would feel if you were busting your butt for 40 hours a week, 20 hours a week, whatever the heck the rule is, and trying to do your very best. And then someone behind a computer tab that's sitting there face guarded by Facebook is able to say whatever they want. You know, it's just, they wouldn't feel good about what they were saying. So it's, it's hard. And that's why, you know, you, you try to block it out as best as possible, but overall it's, it's, you, you can't unsee it once you do. And it makes a difference. Was that something that Crean or, or even moving on? And I, I want to talk obviously a lot about Archie Miller and, and that time in Bloomington, but was that something that, that Crean or, or Archie talk to the team about like regularly about trying to keep those distractions away or, and, and how maybe was their approaches different to, to that? Because I assume as, as a college coach, I mean, you're, you're, you're worried about everything, like in terms of mm -hmm. the day to day of getting ready for the next opponent, you know, figuring out uh, how you're going to, you know, win games, but to have that as an, another thing that you have to worry about. I'm just kind of curious mm -hmm. from a, from a coaching perspective, how that was handled and how they tried to talk to the team about that. Oh yeah. Every coach that I've been, you know, a part of and every team, every coach I've ever talked to, they have to talk about that with their team. You know, it, you, you have to try to stay so tight within that locker room and every coach that I played for at IU preached, you know, it's only the, people that inside of these walls that really matters. We're the only people that know what we do every single day. We're the only people that really have the best interests in mind of each other. So we have to stick together through thick and thin because it's going to, it's, you're going to go through good and bad in every single season. And, you know, we, and we did, we believe that and we, we tried our best to, to always do that. But with the way the world works today, it's impossible to, to keep everything out. Because even if you're not on social media, people come up to you in everyday life while you're walking to class and say things to you. Like, in, in, what are you going to do? Not go to school? You know, you have to do the things you do. And, and, and people say stuff to you at restaurants. Like, you, you, it's impossible to avoid. And, um, you know, a coach can do everything in their power to try to help as much as possible. But they can't hold your hand for 24 hours of the day. And, um, so it's just, it's just part of it and you have to try to just roll with the punches sometimes and you got to be a strong together as a team and individually to, to overcome. So Crean's let go in the spring of 2017, you obviously have time left on your eligibility. You want to stick around. Mm -hmm. You're an IU guy. You love IU. I assume you're, it wasn't much of a decision you wanted to stay what was that transition period like going from, you know, the Crean uh, and then going to Archie um, in terms of that spring, what it was like? Obviously, there was a lot of players coming and going. I think OG obviously left, went pro, mm -hmm. Thomas Bryant, James Blackman. Yep. Um, I think there was some, uh, a couple other guys. I think Grant Gilon left, transferred, mm -hmm. uh, some other. But, but just what was that time like? I mean, obviously, there was a lot of excitement among the fan base to have a new coaching staff come in. But as a player, what was what was that uh, transition period like? And, and was there any thought uh, from your point of view that you would go somewhere else? Or was it basically like, hey, I'm, I'm sticking around? For me personally, you know, I had the opportunity to, to be here because of because of coach Crean and I owed him, I owe him so much for that because it, it's shaped me in my career now and whatever I have now with IU and my, my experiences to him. So I'm always thankful for him. However, when the change was made, I'm, I still 
wholeheartedly wanted to be a Hoosier. You know, that's just, that's who I was. That's who I wanted to be. And so that was a no brainer for me that if, if coach Miller wanted to keep me on this, on the team that I was going to fully do it. But in terms of the transition as, as a team and, and players leaving, um, you know, it's, it was smooth transition for one. It's, it, it's still a lot of change, you know, but um, you know, he, coach Miller came in right away and, you know, he kind of laid the groundwork for what he expected. And, um, you know, we followed him as our new leader because everybody who stayed wanted to stay. So if you were wanting to be there, you were all on board and, you know, it, it did hurt leaving or, you know, some of those guys leaving, but as they should, you know, that two of them went to the NBA. I mean, everybody went to situations where they should, but that's still, we lost a lot of production. You know, those are big time guys, but thankfully we had guys like Jawan Morgan and that came back. Um, Colin Hartman might have, yeah, Colin Hartman had another year. So those were guys that still had great experience and veterans and and were good players. So they helped bring us along the way too, of like, guys, this is, this is the new way. This is what we're going to do. And he's our new leader. He's our coach. We're going to follow him. And so um, the transition was pretty smooth and, and um, it was, you know, it just, it was good, I guess you could say. Yeah, so I'm gonna ask you kind of just a, like a loaded question here, and you can respond as how you, however you wish. But you were obviously a part of Indiana basketball as a player, I think, for two years under Archie, and then two last two years as a graduate mm-hmm. manager. Why do you think things never really took off? Because I, I, I'll say going back to when he was hired, I was very uh, uh, bullish, I guess, on the on the whole hire. I thought in terms of getting mm-hmm. a good young coach in college basketball, he was as good as there was available that spring when they went and got him. And, and I think really in terms of you look at what he did in state recruiting, he he yeah. went out and got some really good players, Romeo Langford, Trace Jackson Davis, who's still mm-hmm. with the program is a potential, uh, you know, big 10 player of the year going into the season. But it felt like something was missing just in terms of kind of taking things to the next level. It seemed like, you know, there would be, some times where momentum was, was established and then things would kind of slide backwards just from your perspective. Why do you think maybe it didn't work out and and what were some of the things that, that you uh, attribute that to kind of big picture? Yeah, that's, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. And um, again, it's a lot of reasons why, you know, it's never just one thing and everybody might always try to pinpoint one thing, but that's impossible. But I mean, overall, you know, I talked about how difficult it is to win. But timing is everything too. you know, the Big Ten has been absolutely a monstrous conference these last four or five years, like absolutely just a beast of a schedule. So every team in the Big Ten is the top 10 toughest schedule in the country. You know, that's just the way it is. So if you don't bring your 110 percent a game, you're going to be in a dogfight or you're going to lose. You know, it's that's just the way it was. And, you know. Coach Miller did do a great job recruiting. He did his, he did exactly what he said he was going to do the inside out approach. You know, it, it, it didn't work out, but you know, one recruit here, one recruit there, like it all makes a difference and it's so timing. And you know what, even sometimes a little luck, it's just what it is. Sometimes the ball goes in, sometimes it doesn't, you could have a great shooting day in practice. Then, you know, come game day, had a bad day and you just, didn't make enough shots. And, and I don't think you can blame that on anybody, but um, you know, if a few balls bounced a different way or a few, whatever, just slight differences here and there, the difference, the road between success and failure is very minuscule. So I don't think there's one thing you can say, but you know, sometimes timing a little luck can make a big difference. So I'll ask you another kind of loaded question here. And it's, it's kind of been become a joke, I guess, on social media now with IU fans and the official IU Twitter account. They've tweeted some stuff and fans have always replied. D- did you guys work on three-point shooting and free throw shooting? Because it seemed like every game after, a- after every game there, I remember like the second season when there was like, I think 12 of 13 that you lost in Big Ten play. It seemed like every game after I wrote the same thing. They didn't make enough threes. Yeah. They didn't make enough free throws. What And, and I'm sure that had to drive you nuts as, as a Bloomington kid who grew mm-hmm. up like that's the first thing you learn. The first fundamental thing you learned about being a basketball player is you got to make shots. And so yeah. I think a lot of Indiana fans kind of wonder, uh, and I would always, people ask me, I mean, I don't know, I'm not in practice. So I'm just kind of curious. I'm going directly to the mm-hmm. source. What, what, what do you attribute yeah. the poor shooting and the, the missed free throws to? 
I know it's, it's funny. Every single Instagram, Twitter post where they're doing some kind of weightlifting or yoga, every, everybody's first comment is how about shooting some free throws or just practicing some shooting drills or whatever. Every single day we worked on three point shooting and free throws every single day. You know, it's, it was a ritual. It was a given. It was every day they do always and extra, you know, even as a graduate manager, I, it was my job to help guys get in the shots up outside of practice. And we had guys that would come in every single day and shoot more, but how many people behind a Twitter page, Twitter app have shot in big 10 play where they're, they got a six foot eight guy closing out on them with a seven foot six wingspan in front of 17,000 people when you're down five points or you're on the free throw line with people chanting your name, how much you stink or you, 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 the back of your mind, we're human too. Just like you guys, it's, you're thinking, oh my gosh, if I miss this free throw, people are going to start booing. Literally it happened. How does that help? You know, it's, mental everything is so mental it's 90 percent of the battle because people got the reps got the reps and then you get into the games and you start just thinking about the other other factors and it's hard to zone in and because there are loud noises here and and you know i i think just more than anything was just the mental aspect because people got the reps they got the shots up and they did the they did the work it's just sometimes mentally it takes just a special person or a special just will to just not care what people think and just focus on the task at hand. So I'm a new Albany guy. So I was, I had a vested interest when Romeo obviously committed Indiana. I grew up Mm -hmm. watching him since middle school and as a high school player. And I was excited that he went to to Indiana. Mm -hmm. That season was so odd and that, you know, that was another one where it kind of started out very good. You know, you beat Louisville at home and have a really good record. I think at one point got ranked and then the, Mm-hmm. The weirdness of the Big Ten schedule where you lose 12 of 13, but the one win is at Michigan State, which yeah. I'm still scratching my head figure and trying to figure out how that, that was the one game. The, like the most, the least likely game to win is the one that you win in that stretch. What yeah. did you see the pressure at all start to take its toll at all on Romeo? And I know a lot of people talked about him, his wrist maybe not being mm-hmm. healthy the whole the whole year. Was that something kind of behind the scenes that, that people knew about, or was that not anything you knew about until like after the season was over? Well, we knew he he was he was going through some injuries with his wrist, and I mean that's a big deal for one. But he never said anything really. And your question to do it, did I see Romeo feel the pressure? Absolutely never. Romeo was level headed the whole time. He was, you know, people always sometimes when they watched him on TV wanted more emotion out of him, but that was just how he played. That's how he that's that was his way of being locked in was staying even keel. You go to the locker room, you see him after the game. He's a normal eighteen year old kid. And that's also what people forget. He's 18 years old. Romeo was a pro's pro in terms of, you know, feeling the pressure. And and people forget how they see, you know, what the final record was or, or, or I don't even what, know what they see. But Romeo was the third leading scoring freshman in the country behind Zion Williamson and R.J. Barrett, who were the number one pick and three pick. Like he had a productive, successful season individually people lose sight of that. And he did that with a broken wrist. He had a great year. And, and I think it's easy to look at the negatives, but people forget how good he really was. And, and, you know, same with Jawan Morgan, he he had an incredible season then too. And I think, you know, our shooting struggles that year really hurt both of them too. And just cause, you know, every team would game plan and compact and be like, Hey, we need to stop these two guys. And if we would have been able to hit a few more shots from the outside, it really would have opened things up for both of them. And they would have even had even greater years. But, I mean, they're both playing the NBA for a reason. They're good players, and they were great Hoosiers, even though Romeo was here for only one year. What was Jawan like as a teammate? He always seemed like, again, from the outside looking in, he he seemed like somebody that would have been a lot of fun to play with and Mm -hmm. somebody that was just a good locker room leadership kind of guy i mean he went through a lot you look at what he came into to what he left i mean it was it was it's a big change i mean and and for Mm -hmm. him to continue to get better and then you know he he didn't get drafted and and he as a rookie i think he became the first undrafted rookie ever to start an nba playoff game so that's Mm -hmm. that kind of tells you about his 
um, drive to get to where he wanted to be. I'm just kind of curious what you thought of him. Is and I'm I'm sure he's somebody you consider a friend, but what what he, what he was like as a teammate and, and inside the locker mm-hmm. room. So I'll talk to Jamo in a couple of different lights. Jamo is was a teammate of mine. He was a friend of mine, and he was also my roommate. So I know Jamo so well. Jamo's one of my best friends. You know, I still talk to him often. Trying to get out there to uh, to Utah to see him play and and just catch up a little bit. But Jamo's a high character guy, and that's why wherever he's been, he's been successful. You know, and that's why he's in the NBA, and that's why he'll stay in the NBA. He's a guy you want in the locker room. He's positive. He gets along with everybody. You know, he's never had someone where he's like, yeah, I don't want to talk to them. I'm, I'm not a, I don't really like them. You know, he likes everybody and everybody likes Jamo. He's just, a, you know, a guy you want to be around. So he's, he's high character. He works his butt off. You know, he gets in there and gets extra work in. You see in the way he plays, you know, he just plays like every game's his last. He, he leaves it all out on the floor. And he just does the little things. That's why he's also going to be successful in the NBA. He doesn't need to score points. For us at IU, he was our beast down low. He was a great passer. He got buckets. He got rebounds. For the NBA, he, you know, he'll be the best screener on the court whenever he's on the on plane. He's going to rebound the ball, and he's going to guard the get best one of the best players. If you watch him when he's in, he's going to do all those things really well, and that's why he's valuable. Every team needs that. No matter what role you have, every role is important. And he's always been, you know, he takes his role seriously and he does it to the best of his ability. But he's just high character is the way to say to describe Juwan Morgan. Great guy and always will be a friend of mine and more. Yeah, he seems like if you're making a list of and my IU basketball knowledge, I mean, I was born in 1982, so I don't really remember much before like the Calvert Cheney years, but like going back to even then, I mean, you're, you're some of the most under, underappreciated, I guess, maybe players. I mean, he, to me, he kind of falls near the top of the list because mm-hmm. he was, you know, I remember that, that season early on where I, it may have been before you got there, but the, this freshman year, his shoulder kept getting yep. dislocated and he kept playing mm-hmm. like the next game it was like, I thought, he was never going to play the rest of the season. There he is back in there the next game. That kind of just showed me early on, like the grit and the toughness of this guy yeah. was much different than uh, I think a lot of guys maybe would have just said, hey, I'm I'm packing it in. I'm not going to play mm-hmm. for a couple of games. I got to get this right. But he was he was right back in there the next game. It was it was amazing to see. And he did that because he loved his teammates and his coaches. You know, he didn't want to sit on the sidelines when he knew he, he thought he could play, even if he had that the a slim chance of them saying we'll see how you feel and you can play if you feel good that meant jamo was playing you know there was no way he was going to hold himself out it just goes to describe the kind the kind of guy he is so when you switch from being an active member of the roster a walk on uh, to a graduate man- manager what was that transition like for you and and how did you know w- when you're a walk on you're obviously involved in playing and practice mm-hmm. part of the scout team, all that stuff. How did your role change from uh, the time that, you know, you left, you, you were done as a player to graduate manager. What were some of your uh, responsibilities once you took on that role? Mm-hmm. So a lot of it honestly stayed the same, but there were different other parts that were very different in terms of like how it was the same as I was still scout team point guard every day as a graduate manager. I still, you know, was, dang near practice player. Like I still was in practice 75% of the time, if not more. However, I was also on the coaching staff. I wasn't, I had to, you know, that there had to be that bridge between player and coach. And, you know, as, as those were still the guys I played with. So it was, it took some, a little bit of a transition, but from right away, I, I, you know, I was like, guys, you know, I used to, those are the guys I was going out with, you know, a couple months ago, but they were very respectful because they knew what I wanted to do. And and the players were like, yeah, John, we get it. Um, um, Cause I, w- I was telling them like, guys, it's, there's certain things now where this is different. And um, so that was actually, it was a transition, but it was one that was very uh, well received by the players. And um, you know, in terms of this, the other things with the coaching staff, you know, we were, it's so much more than you ever think it is, you know? And, and that's, that's getting shots with the other guys. That's doing film work. It was film, film, film. You know, everything's film and game plan. You're putting together games that are eight games 
out in the distance, you know, starting to get those to the assistant coaches so they can start looking at them starting. Then you even help our guys individually. Like, Hey, Hey Rob, what, how, what are you thinking? What are you seeing out there? What do you want to see from your game or the guy you're going to be guarding um, next game? You know, so it, it's it, the graduate manager role was a lot of different um, buckets. And so film getting guys in shoot and still in practice every day, which was still a lot of fun. I get asked this a lot too, so I'll ask you because you you know the answer to this. What's what's what does prep for a a Big Ten game actually look like for a college basketball team? I mean, at Indiana, what what take me through maybe the couple days leading. Let's say it's it's a Sunday and you're playing Wisconsin on Thursday. What what are the couple days leading into that game? What do they look like? And what what all is involved in in that time frame? Okay, so say it's Sunday we play. Thursday. We probably had a game maybe Saturday. Right. So Sunday will be for one, you got to have a little rest in there. You know, you have to be able to have some legs for the next game. So Sunday you're watching film of the previous game uh, offensively first, then defensively you're walking through what we could have done differently. And then you're probably doing a light lift and some shooting. So Sunday's uh, a catch up day in terms of previous game and let's get ready for the week. Game's on Thursday. So Monday, you're going to work on all your stuff. We're going to work on all of Indiana Hoosiers. How are we going to get better today? And that's just, that's everything. Just us. Tuesday, Wednesday are prep days. So Tuesday, you start working against the scout team who is going to be Wisconsin. You know, we're going to be Wisconsin. They're going to be, you know, the Hoosiers. And we're going to be running all Wisconsin stuff. They're going to be guarding us. We're going to start watching um, personnel film on their players. Um, then Wednesday and, and we'll start watching their main actions. So Tuesday, you're starting to watch both players and, and actions Wednesday, you're doing the same thing. You're watching the same film and you're watching maybe against different players, but you're still going up against Wisconsin. And then if it's an away game, you're traveling Wednesday night, you're going to get to the hotel. You're going to watch, you're going to have dinner. You're going to watch more film. And then game day, you're going to have a shoot around. You're going to watch more film. So, I mean, it's, it's usually you start prepping for the team three days in advance at, at the very minimum. And that's watching their film every day. You're going up against the scout team as who's that team running their actions. And, you know, you're prepping for certain things, wrinkles in your offense that you think will work well against what, how they defend certain things. So it, a lot goes into it and it's, but there's usually a steady format in terms of when you really start prepping for a team, which is usually three, three days in advance or prior. In your opinion, as both maybe a player and as a coach, who was the most difficult big 10 team to prepare for? Everybody's different and everybody's got their things that they do really well, but I still think the toughest team to prepare for was always Michigan. They were just, you know, they were, they always had us our number for one and they always played really well, but just they have, and they have good players. So it was a combination of a lot of things, but the way their offense was set up a lot of times, I feel like our defensive philosophies didn't fare too well with them. And they could just always find a way to pick us apart. Even no matter what we changed, they, they knew they, they kind of just had a wrinkle or a or counter that would hit us where it hurt. So Michigan was always tough. So do you, when you talk about the defensive philosophies, are you talking more like the pack line and how it worked against Michigan? Or are you, are you going, are you go, even going back to B line as well? Kind of what you saw there, a combination of both. A little bit of both. And even, um, you know, with the new new staff, they have a lot of the same things that B line did and, and um, just a lot of the same um uh, what am, what's the word I'm trying to say? Concepts. They have very similar concepts and maybe different plays here and there, but the way that they are spread and the way that they, you know, they do their ball screens is very similar. So it kind of makes sense that, you know, it, it, they kind of were tough to guard throughout both tenures of their coaches. And like I said, they always have good players too. How big of an adjustment was it? going from a player going from what Crean did defensively to the pack line and how big of an adjustment do you think it's going to be for these players to, that were there last year going from pack line to what Mike Woodson is going to try to do, which is obviously going to be a lot 
different. Uh, it was funny mm-hmm. when we talked to Woodson in late May. Um, somebody asked him on the Zoom about the pack line, and he laughed and said, "What's the pack line?" So <laughs> he uh, he has he, he's uh, obviously that that word is going to be gone yeah. from the vocabulary, and that's kind of going to mm-hmm. be a thing of the past. But I'm just kind of curious from the adjustment from going from Crean to that, and then what kind of adjustment you think it'll be from going uh, from the pack line to what Woodson's going to do for the current players. I think going from what Crean's defense was to the pack line was a, was a big transition. You know, the pack line is a, is a very, um, you know, by the book kind of defense and it's hard to learn because there's so many technicalities and it's just, there's a lot to the pack line and you have to know, you know, especially with guys that come from high school where they're the best players on their team and they score 30 points a game and you don't really have to play a lot of defense. Then you're learning all about the pack line defense. A lot of those concepts are completely foreign and you've never even heard the terms and vocab before, you know, so that was a definite transition, but we were always a good defensive team too. So it worked, you know, once we got it, it was a good defense and now transitioning from the pack line to what Woodson will be implementing, I think will be a way easier transition because if you have the fundamentals and foundation of the pack line defense, you can learn any kind of defense. You know, the pack line is, is, is hard to learn, and, and if you can learn it, it'll be way easier to do something else that won't be as maybe intricate, but you'll have also those fundamental foundation of defense that you can bring into any kind of defense. So I think it'll be a good transition and they'll be able to, you know, just add whatever coach Woodson has and, and do it well. So we talked a little bit before I hit record here, but you've transitioned obviously away from coaching. So before I kind of, ask you to put on your fan hat and give me some uh, scouting report on a few of these guys that are coming back and maybe what you're looking to see out of the, mm-hmm. this, the team next season, just give everybody an update on kind of what you're doing now and uh, kind of why you decided to to step away from coaching. I know it was something that you've talked about being passionate about, but I know mm-hmm. you got married. I think I sent you a direct message to come on the podcast while you're on your honeymoon. So my, yeah. my apologies for that, but you responded to me, which I was like, man, you don't have to respond while you're on your honeymoon, but th- thanks for doing that. But yeah, what, uh, what, um, so what are you, what are you up to now? And, and kind of what was the decision mm-hmm. like for you to, to kind of step away from being involved in basketball? Yeah. So now I'm currently working at uh, Bill C. Brown Associates, which is a financial uh, services company here in Bloomington. So anything in the financial professional and advisor um, world is, is what I'm doing now. And I'm, I love the, The company is amazing. It's been in Bloomington for over 60 years and, you know, it's just been helping people in any way that they can, whether that's, you know, protecting their family or setting up a financial plan for their future. So it's really meaningful work and I'm really enjoying it. And I love where I am and the people that I work with, but how I got there was, as I talked about, I wanted to coach, you know, I really, that was my whole goal was to be a head coach. And, you know, I loved, as I've also mentioned, I loved my time at IU and I loved my time with the staffs that I had the opportunity to learn from and play for and coach with. And, um, however, being in it for a few years, you, you realize how big of a beast it is of being a college coach. You know, it takes a lot. It takes a toll on your mental health. It takes a toll on your family life. And, um, you know, realistically, everybody sees the coaches that are on TV every day, but that's the 1%, you know, 99% of the people are, you know, not on TV, not making the big million dollar contracts and, and grinding away every day so that they can keep their job. And, you know, with me getting married to my beautiful, lovely wife, Maddie, Maddie Jagger, you know, that kind of really put things into perspective on what is important to me, you know, and, and I didn't want us to have a family where we were going to be moving every two to four years, the average 10 years, about two and a half years for a college coach. And, and me moving to get the next job or stay ahead of getting fired wasn't something that I wanted for my family and me, you know? So that really helped me put into perspective what was important. And that was, you know, first and foremost, that's my faith, it's my family. And then that's my professional career. So, you know, I kind of look at the last, you know, how everything ended with, with our coach Miller's staff, with how we ended up getting let go. And, I look at it as a blessing in disguise now, because if it didn't happen, I'd probably still be doing it. And would I be happy? Yes. But for what it was going to be a detriment to my family, I, it wasn't worth it for me. And that's kind of what helped me realize that was going through the reality of the business very early. 
And so um, I'm happy everything happened the way it did. I, I, I would never want anybody to get fired or, I mean, it's never it's good to go through that. And, and but, um, but now I'm happy to just, I'll still be a Hoosier for life and I'll just be watching from a different seat now. It'll be odd, you know, the last five years of my life, I've been, that's been my life. And I've been sitting right on that bench and watching and being my whole livelihood on the line. And now I'll be able to watch it from either the comfort of my own home or from the seats. And, and I'll still be pulling for every, every Hoosier program in the athletics department. So happy where I am and happy for what I learned and experienced on staff and as a player at IU. It's probably better for you to figure that out now than in like three years when you're at like Southeast Arizona Community College yeah, as the head coach. Exactly. You're like, what you am I? Yeah, you, you got a kid. You're like, what am I? What am I doing yeah. here? What so am I that's doing? The, so no, definitely better to happen sooner rather than later. Absolutely. So I want to kind of run through some of the guys on this current upcoming roster and kind of get your thoughts mm-hmm. on on them because you have a obviously a unique perspective and. The first one that comes to mind that, that I think a lot of people are curious about, and and I'll say I've been as high on this guy as anybody, and I still think there's a lot of potential in there to really ha- be a, a really productive player, is Rob Fennessy. Because mm-hmm. I remember watching him in high school. There was just something about him that led me to think that he was going to be a really solid Big Ten point guard. And you know he's been through his ups and downs, had his share of injuries, but there's always – he he always seems to to make the right play and and be in the right position but confidence you know talking to Dane Fife earlier this spring i had him on the podcast and you know he talked about just trying to get rob's confidence back and um yeah. what do you, do you think it it just comes down to that with rob and and what did you see out of him you know his first uh you know you were his teammate for for three, or mm-hmm. his teammate for a year and then obviously you you coached him for a couple of years what what mm-hmm. do you what are you looking for out of the this year out of Rob and, and what do you think maybe we'll see differently? Yeah. Rob is an unbelievable kid. You know, all he wants to do is please. And, you know, he came in as a freshman and had a really good year, you know, but then he got riddled by some of those injuries that you talked about. And that, that kind of got him for one out of his rhythm a little bit. And then when you come back from an injury, you're just trying to play in a way that you don't get hurt again sometimes because you might not be hundred percent or just at least mentally, you don't feel like you are, but Rob is a, as I said, he's a great kid. He He's a hard worker every single day, comes in extra. But what Rob, you know, that confidence is huge for any any kid our age. And, um, you know, I think he'll get his swagger back this year. I really do. I think, you know, the staff and has already done a great job of, you know, saying, Rob, we need you to be the player that we know you can be and you know you can be. And um, first and foremost for Rob, I think that means him being an absolute bulldog defender. You know, just absolutely making – his matchups life, a living hell. Cause he can do that. We've seen him do that. And defense always travels. And I think he'll be a, a beast in that regard this year. And then offensively, he's a, he's a great point guard. You know, he, he controls the pace. He makes the right decision. And then I think he's going to be a more consistent shooter this year. And so I think he's going to be a guy that will, you know, bring the team along with him and, and do a really, you know, great job of, getting everybody where they need to go when they need to be there and making plays when he needs to make plays and getting the ball where it needs to go and making people better. But as long as Rob is, is a a dog on the defense, he's going to be a a really good player. And I I expect Rob to have a a big year because I think he's going to be in the right mental space and he's going to be ready to go. Trace Jackson Davis, obviously I think made a decision that surprised some people in coming back because I think he could have at minimum probably got, got gotten a two way deal in the NBA. He he would mm-hmm. have gotten probably a look from somebody, but coming back with, you know, I think with the name image and likeness stuff, I think he can be a guy that really benefits from that. And also mm-hmm. just another year under a coach who's been in the NBA that kind of knows what it takes to get there. What, what do you see as maybe one or two things? I mean, everyone talks about developing the right hand, which I, yeah. you know, I don't know how much we're going to see him, purposely taking shots with his right hand uh, or I don't know, we're going to see him shooting threes, but is there anything like you look at with him and say, these are like one or two things that he really has to do better if he wants to be big 10 player of the year or a guy that does get drafted in a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. uh, Trace is another, everybody's a great kid. I keep saying it, but it's just so true. Everybody's everybody be every fan that doesn't know these guys personally, we'd be so happy with the kind of people that they really are outside of basketball. 
but Trace, you know, he's an unbelievable athlete and you can, you cannot teach what he can bring. You know, he's just superior in so many ways in that regard that he can do a lot of things that people can't without even knowing it or trying. I think one of the things that'll be really valuable for him and having coach Woodson is coach Woodson has been a, around pros for years and he knows how pros are and how they act every single day and what it means to be a pro. So I think Trace's approach will be um, much different in terms of every single day, every single minute, every single thing that you do is either a debt to your body and your game or a credit. And, you know, being a pro is being an everyday pros pro. And that's what coach Cliff always, always preaches. You know, you gotta be a pros pro. And, and that means every lift matters, everything matters. And I think having the wisdom of coach Woodson and having coached guys like Carmelo Anthony and Raymond Felton and just really solid pros will be huge in mentoring and culturing that professionalism within trace. And that'll transfer to the floor of just consistency and, and just taking every little detail, like it matters because the devil is in the details. And if you want to make it in the pros, you gotta be, you gotta, you gotta know that. Cause it's, it's, it's very minimal uh, difference between making it and not making it. And I, I full fully expect and hard, wholeheartedly believe that trace is a pro. And so I'm excited to, to watch him mature in front of our eyes. And I think it'll, you know, do a lot of good in his career in the long run. One guy I know that everybody's going to be rooting for, um, Parker Stewart, obviously came mm-hmm. to Indiana, uh, unfortunate, uh, passing of, of his, of his father and, and difficult, uh, for him or for anybody to, to endure, uh, losing a parent, but you know, he, he came to Indiana and then to play for coach Miller. I know he has a really great relationship with Kenya Hunter, um, Mm -hmm. but then had a coaching change, decided to stick around. Uh, I think he started both games in the Bahamas, but you saw him last year. uh, I think some in practice and workouts, what did you see out of him and and where do you think he can really help this team? Yeah. Um, he's been through a lot, you know, as you kind of mentioned, I mean, he's had a lot in his plate. He's had a lot he's had to deal with at such a young age. And that's, that's tough for anybody, let alone a 21 year old kid. And, um, you know, he, he's very, you would have never known it because he's a strong kid. You know, he's very strong mentally and physically he's beast too. But, uh, you know, Parker is an unbelievable shooter. And I think that's where he's going to, he's, he fills an immediate need there. You know, he's, he can, you leave him open. It's, you're going to get that ball out of the bottom of the net and be throwing it so he can go in the other, other way on offense. Cause he is a not down shooter. And I think uh, people will see that very quickly. And um, I'm excited to see him do well because he's a great player. And he, it's been a while since he's been able to play because he's had some injuries as well. So I, he's a great teammate. He's a great shooter and he's going to have a, a good year for the Hoosiers and hopefully he'll be making a lot of threes for us this year. Do you see Miller Cop as another guy that can kind of do some of the same things just in terms of shooting? I mean, I know he's not a guy that you've played with, but you've mm-hmm. played against him and watched him uh, at Northwestern. Yeah. I thought he was, he, you know, I see all these lists of like impact transfers and I saw one list like like top 100 and he wasn't even on there. And I'm like, this guy averaged like 11 or 12 points last year mm-hmm. at Northwestern. He's not coming to Indiana to sit the bench. He's going to play a role. Yeah. So wh- what do you think of him just um, watching him at, at Northwestern and what he can do mm-hmm. for Indiana? Yeah, I, I, I wish I would have been around him more just because, you know, I have a, I still talk with a lot of guys on the staff and I still have a relationship with some of the players. So I still get to talk with them often. And, you know, I hear so many good things about him. You know, obviously everybody knows that he's a really good shooter and that he's a really high IQ kind of player. And every team needs that, both of those. And he brings those right away. But one of the things that is invaluable is his experience and his leadership. You know, I've, I've heard more good things about his, uh, his locker room presence and his beautiful jump shot, you know. So I think that is going to be, you know, really beneficial. And he's also very versatile. You know, he's, he's got great size. And, um, you know, so he can, he can be a guy that can play as a perimeter player and shoot threes from the corner, or you never know. I, I personally don't know, but I could see him being in some pick and pop type actions, you know, creating mismatches, mismatches and getting some threes in that regard. So I think his versatility leadership and obviously the way he can shoot the ball are going to be, you know, immediate impact 
stuff right at the start. So two quick ones before I, I let you get out of here. Um, one, maybe I could have thrown in earlier, just go, going back to your days as a player. What was your favorite Big Ten road trip to take? Like when you went on the road, what was what was your favorite um, place to go, and why why mm-hmm. would you pick why would you pick that particular place? Yeah, so obviously going to Purdue is incredible, just because you know I always say with Purdue fans, they hate IU a lot more than IU hates them. And I think that's kind of the little brother in them. You know, your little brother always kind of wants to beat up on you, but the big brother, it's just, it's whatever. But that's always fun just because the environment is incredible. And, you know, you can feel it right when you walk in the arena that, you know, they really don't like you. And sometimes, you know, that's just fun to be around. But um, I, I always thought Michigan State was awesome too. And one, because we usually, we always played well there. We usually beat them. And if not, it went to overtime or double overtime, whatever. But that place, you know, they've always had amazing teams. And Tom Izzo has built the program that's, you know, one of the blue bloods. So going in there, that place is absolutely always rocking. It's like a party in there. And and then when, you know, we come in there and play well and beat them, it's just it, you always leave with the good, good memories from there. So I, I'd say Michigan State was always a place we looked forward to. And then Purdue was always a place that was just, you know, unbelievable atmosphere as well. So Indiana tips off its season, I think, November 9th. Uh, I think Eastern Michigan's the opponent. Where will Johnny Jager be for that game? Will you be relaxing on the couch watching the game? Will you be in Assembly Hall? Like, What's, what's going to be – you're moving into a different phase now mm-hmm. of, your, of your involvement with IU basketball, so you, can, you're, you won't be on the bench, but where will you be and kind of how, how do you plan to follow this season? That's it's so odd to even hear that just because I'm not ready for it for one. And I don't know exactly where I'll be. I think I'll be at a lot of the games this year just because, you know, it's still the staff that I know and love. It's still a lot of the players that I've played with and coached for. And, um, but I don't know where I'll be watching it, but I do know that I'll be watching it with the coach's eye. That's for sure. And if, you know, if race misses a block out, trace needs to finish with his right hand or, or whatever it may be, I'm going to text him afterwards and I'm going to get on him. But uh, look, that's half-heartedly a joke. But um, mm-hmm. but so wherever I will be watching, I'll be watching it like a coach. And, uh, but, you know, I'll be supporting the Hoosiers forever through thick and thin. And hopefully we got a lot of good things coming. And I think uh, I'm very optimistic that, it, that it's going to be a fun time. Well, Johnny, thanks for uh, carving out some time this afternoon. It was a lot of fun to... To kind of go through your your time in Bloomington and uh, get your perspective on a lot of things, and, and maybe once uh, the season tips off and we get some games under our belt, I'll, I'll have you back on and you can uh, give me some uh, some of your observations from with your coach's eye because like I'm just a I'm just a silly media guy. I don't have the <laughs> the basketball acumen uh, that you do. So uh, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to join us today. Absolutely, I had this was awesome and. If you want to do it again, I'm always game to talk about the Hoosiers. So I appreciate you uh, reaching out and having me, you know, maybe enlighten some people in some way. And if not, it was still fun. So I appreciate it. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening uh, to this episode of Podcast on the Brink. We'll be back uh, next week. As always, if you enjoy the show, leave us a rating or a review on iTunes or Spotify. And like I said, we'll be back next week with another episode of Podcast on the Brink.